Okay, um, so hey guys, welcome back to our advanced lecture series. Um, today we're going to be talking about Mohs algorithm. So the motivating problem for this is uh, you're given an array of size n and a bunch of queries where you want to find the mode of subarrays um, quickly. And uh, an important thing is you can process these queries offline, which means that you don't have to answer them in order. Um, so you can like move them around or answer them in any order you want, pretty much. And yeah, so basically for every subarray or for every subarray that we query, we want to find the most common element. And if there's multiple, you can return any. So like if this was your array um, and your range was one to four, you look at the first four elements and the most common element here is two. So you would return two. Um, and I don't know if you guys have seen seg trees before. Um, probably not. That's kind of a similar type of um, structure, but that doesn't work here. Um, even something special as like a merge sort tree isn't going to work here. Okay. So let's kind of simplify the problem a little bit. Um, instead of like doing these queries on arbitrary ranges, um, let's set up a data structure that has three operations. One where you add a number, you're basically maintaining a set, right? So your three operations here are add a number to the set, remove a number from the set, and find the most common number in the set. So can we solve this problem fast? I'll give you guys a minute to think about that. And if you have any questions, please speak up. There is a way to have the data structure do all this in constant time, like each operation. Um, but all we're really looking for here is log n. Yeah, pretty much. Um, you basically want to store for every element, how many times does it show up? Um, and if we use a set, um, we can get the element that shows up the most in log n time. Um, but basically, the way you would do this is you would store a set of uh, like the number of occurrences of the item as the first value, uh, a set of pairs where each pair is the number of occurrences of the value and then the value itself. Um, and you would need like a separate array to keep track of how many, to keep track of the counts of every value. And that would let you sort of update those pairs. Um, basically the idea is like, if you want to add something to this set, you increment its count, um, you remove old count. I should probably write this out somehow. Actually, I can probably just explain the O of one solution. It's probably easier. So the O of one solution is uh, you have a bunch of linked lists. Um, so at all possible counts, um, you keep a list of numbers that have that count, right? And so um, adding or deleting is basically moving a number up or down by, um, by one spot um, on the list, right? Because uh, if you are adding a number to the set, you're increasing the count by one. So you're moving it from its current count to its current count plus one. Um, and so the maximum is only gonna change by one at a time, so you can maintain that as you go. And then your output is just any number that's at the maximum count. Does this solution make sense? The compressed part just means that the amount of distinct numbers you have is small and can be sort of, and you sort of move, put them into like the consecutive range from zero to the number of distinct numbers you have. So you can get each linked list for the count, you know, in, uh, yeah. No one time. That's all that means. Sorry, why is it necessary? I just thought about it again. Actually, I'm, how do you do the movement in a one? Because this is all indexed by count, right? 
Oh, I see. Just store the po pointers. Yes, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, you have the, the list of pointers needs to be, you need to be compressed. That's why. Okay. For, for, for each I number, mean, you, sort of the, you store a pointer. The easier way to explain list. this is to replace your linked lists with sets or like Java tree sets or any of those like balanced binary trees. Um, and then you can uh, remove, add or remove in log n time. That is probably the easier way to think about it. And that, that's another log n solution. The point here is that if you store pointers, so for the value five, let's say, you store a pointer from five, from the array five, to the linked list node that contains that number five. Oh. And then so you can move that in a while. Okay. Because linked list lets you delete and add quickly. Yeah, so that you can reach it to O1 that way. Okay. But yeah, so basically the point of this is we have this data structure. We can do these three operations fast. We can insert, we can delete, and we can um, get the most common element. We can do that all quickly. So now we're going back to the original problem, which again is um, we have these queries where you have a subarray and you want to return the most common element quickly. And we're gonna use this data structure to do that. Okay, so here's how we're gonna do that. First, uh, you wanna split your array into blocks of size S, where S is some number that's about square root N. Um, and then we're gonna sort the queries first by the block their left endpoint lies in, and then by their right endpoint. And we're gonna do an example of this on the next slide. Um, and so then basically the idea is we're going to assume that we've like done one query, right? So we have sort of, um, we have the answer for one range. The, what we're going to do to get to the next query is we're going to, um, move the endpoints until we get to where the next query is. And at each step where you're moving the endpoint, what does that really correspond to? That be basically means you're either adding one if you're expanding the range by one, like you're adding an element to your set, uh, or you're deleting one if you're like decreasing the size of your interval by one. And then after we've done all these add and deletes, um, we have the next range and we can do our query. All right, so we're basically converting um, the problem from before into the problem we just solved. Does that make sense on a high level? Um, basically, to get between queries, we're just moving the endpoints one step at a time until we get there. Now, we haven't explained why that's fast yet, so we'll get to that. But does anyone have any questions about like how this works at a high level? Okay. Yeah, so uh, for how we're sorting the queries, here's an example of how that would work. So we have our array of size 16. Uh, we're gonna split that into blocks of size uh, square root n. So n is a square number here, which is nice. So we can split it into four blocks of four. If not, you just get close enough to square root n, it's fine. Um, and this is our list of queries here. So again, we can do these queries offline. So we can answer them in any order we want. Um, so what we're gonna do is sort them the way we were talking about on the last slide. So first we want to sort them by what block their left endpoint is in, right? So these two queries have left endpoints of one and three, which are in the red block. These two have left endpoints of five and six, which are in the orange block. These two have left endpoints of nine, which is in the green. And this query has a left endpoint of 13, which is in the blue. Okay, and then within each of these groups, we're going to sort them by increasing right endpoint. And notice that this might mean the left endpoints are not sorted, right? So for the red list, uh, eight is smaller than 12, so we put this one first, even though the left endpoints are no longer sorted. Um, same thing here, six is smaller than seven, nine is smaller than 15, and here we only have one. And then to get the final order of queries, we just go through each of these lists in order of the blocks. Okay, um, questions on how this works? So you're basically sorting first by which block is your left endpoint in, 
And then if your left endpoints are in the same block, you sort by whichever right endpoint is smaller. Okay. Yeah, so now um, how we process the queries. Um, this is like what I was saying before. So let's say we've answered the first query, which is 3.8, right? Um, and now our next query is 112. So to get to that, um, we're going to first shift our left endpoint to the left twice, which corresponds to adding the value here and adding the value here. And then we're going to shift our right endpoint to the right four times, which is going to correspond to adding this value, adding this value, adding this value, and adding this value. So basically, to get between these two queries, we're doing six add operations. And then we can just do a get mode query and get the most common element here. All right. Any questions on this? Oh, I haven't been looking at chat. Oh, OK. There's nothing new. All right. Yeah, so now uh, we're going to talk about what the complexity of doing this is and sort of why we've sorted the queries this way. Um, so let's look at how many times the left endpoint is going to shift first. So notice that if two queries are in the same block, your left endpoint is going to shift by at most square root n, right? Because if they're in the same block, um, they're in the same segment of square root n things. So to get between them is only square root n steps. Um, and this is going to happen for every query. Right? Worst case, you're moving square root n for every query. And then if you're going from one block to the next, the left endpoint is going to shift by at most square root n extra. Um, and I say extra because that's you can think of that as kind of on top of the square root n initially. Right, Because if you're moving from one block to the next, you can move up to two square root n. Right? But that's kind of covered by square root n for this part and square root n for this part. Um, yeah, so basically going from one block to the next, um, you're only shifting by an extra square root n. And this is only going to happen square root n times because we only have square root n blocks, right? There's only square root n times that you're going to be going from one block to the next. And so um, the total number of times we're shifting the left endpoint is uh, q times square root n for this part, plus square root n times square root n for this part. So the total number of times we're shifting it is O of n plus q square root n, where q is our number of queries. Questions on this? OK, so that is the left end point. Uh, now let's do the same thing for the right endpoint. So let's think about all the queries that have this, their left endpoints within a given block. The right endpoint is just basically making one pass down the array, right? Because for things that are in the same block, we are sorting them by increasing right endpoint. So the right endpoint just has to make one pass through the array for that block. And then once we're done with that block, it has to sort of go all the way back to the left to reset for the next block. So it's going 2n shifts at most for every number, for every block. So it's 2n root n, which is O of n root n. OK? And so combining this with the left side, um, so the left is O of n plus q squared n, and the right is O of n root n. So the total is O of n root n plus q root n. So we're doing basically n plus q root n shifts in total. Um, so the complexity of solving the problem isn't going to be O of n root n. Because remember, the data structure we had um, did operations in log n. So we're doing O of n plus q root n operations, and each one is log n. So your complexity would be O of n plus q root n times log n, unless you use the constant time version, in which case you do get um, a complexity of O of n plus q root n. 
right. Um, any questions about the complexity or how this works? Okay. So the implementation um, is pretty straightforward for this, which is nice. Uh, so the way we usually like to do it is you make an array Q, uh, where Q just holds the numbers from 0 up to Q minus 1, right? So uh, initially, Q is just like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever, up to Q minus 1. Uh, and it's basically representing the index of the query, right? Because eventually, we need to recover the index of the query so that we can print them in the correct order. Right, so we can answer the we can like solve the queries in any order we want, but eventually we're going to have to print them out in the correct order. So we need to kind of undo that at the end. Um, so the way we do that is uh, by basically not sorting the L's and R's themselves, but instead the indices of the queries. So uh, this is our comparator. Um, Actually, I'm not sure if we went over custom comparators in the C++ lecture on Thursday. Um, but basically, the idea here is we're sorting Q um, with this comparator that we're defining for two LLs. Um, so for query index A and query index B, we're saying that query index A should come before B if um, its left endpoint block is less than B's left endpoint block. Or if they're the same, if their blocks are the same, um, if it's right endpoint, um, I think that should be less than RB. Um, but either way works. So you can sort the Rs in either direction. So this is just doing the query comparator we had before. Um, and then we want to start our range as empty and then process the queries. So basically, we say that the current left is 0 and the current right is negative one. And the reason for this is we want to um, add, like when we first um, add elements into our range, we want to add the first one. Um, and if we had R is zero, that would sort of indicate that we've already added the first one. Um, because basically the way cur L and cur R works is we have inserted everything from cur L to cur R inclusive into our set currently. And so we want that to initially be empty. So the only way to do that is to make cur r uh, less than cur l. Um, yeah, and so then for each of our queries, while cur r is less than the right endpoint of the query, we're going to um, increment the current right and add the value of that position to our mode data structure. And if the cur r is too big, we want to take one off. Um, so we want to remove the value at cur r from our mode data structure and then decrement cur r. And then same thing for cur l. If cur l is uh, too small, we want to increment it and remove that value. If cur l is too big, we want to decrement it and add that value. And then once we've done this, we can just set ants i to be the query value. Questions on the implementation? And here, um, the add, delete, and queries are the O of log n functions we were talking about before for solving for mode. OK. Yeah, so what we did here for mode generalizes pretty well. Um, so we're going to kind of use the same structure we had for uh, the mode problem, uh, but sort of generalize it for any problem. So any data structure where you can add an element, delete an element, and query an element in O of Tn time, where Tn is some complexity. Um, if we do this sorting queries thing, we can then solve the problem in O of n plus q root n times Tn. Right, so Tn was log n last, for the last problem. Uh, but it could be any complexity, really. Okay. So a few things to note. 
Um, you might not always want to use a block size of square root n, depending on the specific problem. Um, for the vast majority of problems I've seen, you do want to use square root n. Um, but notice that the actual complexity here is going to be O of qs time, uh, plus n squared over s. So usually what you're going to see is n equals q. And so if n equals q and all your operations are the same cost, so adding, um, deleting, and querying are all the same cost, which is going to happen in most of your problems, um, you're going to want to use uh, s equals n over root q. Um, and it, again, if n equals q, then that's just squared root n. Um, also, usually what we do is instead of an actual class, so like instead of having this mode ds.add, we usually just have a function where you do update index and then plus or minus one, where plus one indicates you're adding index, minus one indicates you're subtracting. Um, and then you can store the current answer globally. Uh, and this is a really nice trick. So you can modify the comparator a little bit because notice that every time, um, like I said, the right end for every block, the right endpoint scans across the array once from left to right, and then it has to reset to do the next block, right? But if you kind of snake it so that for the first block, it, it goes left to right, and then for the second block, it goes right to left, and then the third block, it goes left to right, and you keep going like that, you save a factor of two in terms of how much the right endpoint is moving. So that's a slight modification that we usually add to the problem. Um, you just kind of alternate which direction the right endpoint goes by which block you're in. Um, it usually doesn't matter, but it can give you a nice speed up sometimes. So the general implementation basically looks like this. Um, here's our updated comparison with the snaking. Um, so if they're in different blocks, again, it's the same comparator because we process the blocks in order by left endpoint. But then if they're in the same block, notice that we're checking if we're in an odd or an even block here. And based on that, we're sort of using the reverse comparators here. So we're going either left to right or right to left based on if you're in an odd or even block. And then this part is very much the same. Um, the only differences are we're using our update function here where update with one means you're adding that value and update with negative one means you're removing that value. And we're also storing the final answer in the total variable here, but very similar to what we had for mode. So uh, as we go forward into the problems, um, we're going to basically assume that we have this code written out and all we have to worry about is how to do updates pretty much because this part of the code is going to be the same for basically every most problem you do. Questions on this? OK. Yeah, so um, our update function um, would basically look like this for both. Um, this is what I was talking about before. This is the first login solution we had. Um, basically, you want to maintain the count of every value. So we can do that with a map. And then we also have this set um, that sort of gives us the best one. So the pairs here are number of times the value occurs, comma, the value. So we're sorting first by the number of times it occurs. So the biggest element in this set is going to be the element with the biggest count, right? Um, so if we want to get the mode, all we have to do is take the R begin, so take the biggest element in the set, and then take the second, which gives us the actual value. Uh, and then to update this set, so if we want to uh, update a value A, first we want to remove count A, A from best, right? Because this count A is old, and we need to update it. So we're going to remove it, remove this from best. Then we're going to update count A by adding D, which remember is either plus or minus one. So plus one corresponds to adding it, minus one corresponds to removing it. So adding D has the correct effect on the count. And then we're going to add count A, A back in, because this is now the updated correct value. Um, yeah, and then 
we get the best again to sort of get the updated best value. Questions on the code? Okay. Uh, there are other comparators you can use that have kind of similar ideas. Although, again, like I said, in 99% of cases, you'll be okay with what we have. Um, but if you're interested in looking more into it, um, this CodeForces blog goes really in depth into one of them, uh, which uses the traveling salesman problem and 2D Hilbert curve. Um, so there's some like crazy stuff going on in here. And it gets your complexity of O of n root Q times Tn. Which again, if um, n and q are the same, which they will be in most problems, um, it's usually not going to be much of an improvement. But if you have q is much smaller than n, um, then you can get a really big improvement. So this probably isn't going to be super useful, but it can definitely be an interesting thing to check out if you're interested. OK, so now we're going to get into some problems. All right, so for this first problem, um, you have an array of size n, um, where ks represents the number of occurrences of s. So the power of an array, we define that to be s times ks squared over all distinct s you have in an array. Right, so like let's say uh, this highlighted part was your array. Um, one occurs three times. Uh, so s times ks squared would be 1 times 3 squared, which is 9. 2 occurs twice. So s times ks squared there would be 2 times 2 squared, which is 8. And 3 occurs one time. So uh, that would be 3 times 1 squared. That should be 1 squared. Um, so you get 9 plus 8 plus 3, you get 20 for the power of this subarray. And here we're given q queries of the form lr where you want to output the power of the separate from L to R. So once again, um, we the actual like uh, most part of the template is going to be basically the same. The one part we have to implement now is the update function, where you're either adding an element or removing an element. So I'll give you guys a minute to think about how to do that. Um, but yeah, that's really the only part of the problem you have to think about solving is how do we like add an element to a range? How do we take an element out of a range and keep the answer properly updated? And as one hint, um, the thing we were talking about on the last problem, where like you want to kind of remove the stale count, the the like outdated count from your set, and then update the count and add it back to your set, that's going to be a very common theme in a lot of these problems. Um, like kind of removing the old value from whatever answer you had, uh, and then updating it and then adding it back. So think about how you can kind of remove the contribution of an element and then update its value and then add that contribution back to the final answer. Uh, that's really like the key idea behind most of these solutions.
think about what like the information is that you need to maintain to when you get a new element to calculate its contribution in the first place. What is that information you need? I can show you guys this one. Um, and then I think seeing this one will kind of help you uh, get the idea for the next ones. Because there's a lot of common themes between these problems. So yeah, basically the idea is we want to maintain the count of every number in the current range. And then when you update the count, update the total answer. Um, and we're using this pattern that's going to show up a lot in a lot of these problems, where we subtract the power of the element from the total, we update the count, and we add the power of the element back to the total. So what that's going to look like is we have this uh, count array, um, where count i is just the number of occurrences of i in the current subarray. And then if we want to update i with d, where again d is 1 or negative 1, First, we want to subtract out the power of AI, right? Because total is going to maintain the sum of the powers of the elements. So um, we want to subtract out the uh, old power, right? Because count is now outdated. So we want to subtract out this value, um, which is the current power of AI. We want to update the count, and we want to add the new power back. Right, because you could kind of think of this as the old contribution of AI to the sum. So we re remove that. Uh, we want to update the count. And now that the count is updated, we can add the updated version back. This is kind of how you want to think about these problems. It's really about like how do we subtract out the con contribution of one element and then update its value and then add its contribution back. Anyone have questions on this? Anyone confused at all? Like not even specific questions. Anyone yeah. not understand this or anything we've done so far? Because yeah. no one has uh, asked any questions. It's kind of concerning. This is a very important thing to understand for these problems in general, because it, it is going to show up like over and over again. Okay. Guess we can move on to the next problem. Okay. So we have an array of size n, um, and you have some favorite number k, and we have once again we have q queries in the form lr, um, and these queries are going to be a little bit different. Um, so we want to know how many subarrays of this subarray have a Zor sum equal to k. So you're kind of thinking of subarrays of subarrays here. So like if this is your subarray, the highlighted part here, there are four subarrays that XOR to three. So one of them is two, three, because two XOR one is three. Um, one of them is three to six, 
because one XOR of one, XOR of zero, XOR of three is three. Then you have five, six, because zero, XOR of three is three, and six, six, because the three is three. Um, and we want to be able to count how many of these subarrays there are uh, within the larger subarray. So this isn't quite in the same format um, that the other problems have been in so far. So the first thing to think about is how do we convert it to um, a problem that's more like the last couple ones we saw. Any ideas or observations? Or we should just shout it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yes, any line. So think about how you can compute um, the Zor sum of a subarray with um, basically without iterating over it and taking the XOR of all the numbers. Think about if there's a faster way to do that. It's the first step. It's kind of a similar idea to um, if you had to do like range sums quickly. Pretty much, yeah. You're gonna basically do like prefix XORs. Um, so yeah, instead of looking at the array itself, uh, we wanna look at the partial Zora sums, PI where pi is the xor of everything up to i. Um, and notice that if we want the Zor sum of an array, a subarray from i to j, that's just going to be uh, pi Zor pj. I think that should actually be pi minus 1 Zor pj. Usually when um, we do partial sums, we like 1 index them, right? I think that's the idea. But then wouldn't it be pi Zor pj plus 1? or? I mean, the way I code at least partial is that you do i, j, okay. half open, and then you do one index, and that just works out. Oh, OK. So this is a half open interval. Yeah. OK. But, uh, yeah, but basically, the idea is, um, regardless of how you do your indexing, the Zor of an array uh, is basically the Zor of uh, everything up to the end of it and everything before the beginning of it, right? Because you're kind of canceling out everything before the beginning because that's all going to show up twice. Yes, exactly. This is working because a is or a equals zero. So everything that appears before this subarray is going to be in there twice. And so it's all going to be canceled out. Um, and everything that's in the subarray is going to be in there once. So that's going to work. OK, so now we've kind of reduced the problem um, to we want to find any indices i and j that are in our subarray such that pi is or pj equals k. And because of the nice properties of XOR, um, this is equivalent to PI XOR K equals PJ. And now this is kind of in a more familiar format to what we saw before. So, um, so, so first question is, what is like the equivalent of contribution in this new setting? That right. like, in, instead of power, what is the contribution going to be for this problem? I think you can anyone shout that out. Um, not 
right? Because we're looking for like the number of subarrays, right? We want some way to count the number of subarrays such that pi zor k equals pj. So how do we maintain that? I guess the idea is like, if we're adding an index i, how do we update um, the number of subarrays that i would be an endpoint of that is order to k? Because for each of those subarrays, we need to find some pj such that pj equals pi zor k. I'll ask more specific question. For a given value of PI, PI, like let's say it's five or something, right? Um, what would be its sort of contribution to the count? Think of how yeah, to answer that specifically. So like, yeah, like a key said, for a given PI value, what is that value's contribution to the number of subarrays? Because we want sort of the number of subarrays such that the PI is or K equals PJ. So for a given PI value, how many of those subarrays are there? Right, but pj has to be a certain value, right? And, and also you could have exactly a bunch of, of yeah, um, yeah. What Joe's saying. Yeah, and you could also have a bunch of values with a prefix or of pi. Pi5 could show up like a bunch of times. Like it could show up three times. You're close though. You're definitely close. Pretty much. Um, basically, the idea is you want to maintain how many times um, each XOR value occurs, right? So um, let's say some value, um, we have some value X, right? right? So PI equals X, basically. Um, we need to find how many ways we can match X with XOR K. So sort of the contribution of X is count x times count x or k. Because for every, because count x is the number of values where pi equals x, right? And so for each of those values, we can pair them up with every value where pj equals x or k. And so the number of ways to do that is count x times count x or k. Um, we do have this one 
um, edge case where x equals x or k, uh, which will only happen if k equals zero. Um, but in that case, you do basically count x choose two, right? Because you don't want to count duplicates. But you don't really have to worry too much about that, that case. That'll only happen if k equals zero. Um, but yeah, in the other case, you're basically taking the number where pi equals x and multiply it by the number where pi equals x or k. And that, that's sort of the contribution for a value of pi. pi equals x. Um, and then, so now we can use sort of the same idea as before and subtract out um, this contribution, then update count x and add this contribution back. Does that make sense? The implementation is here. This probably they can make a bit more sense. Um, yeah, so basically x is ai, which is pi from before. So this is our partial xor up to i. Um, and then other, which is the other value we need, is xor k. So then we want to subtract out the contribution, which we have this ternary here to check um, if x equals x or k. Um, but basically, you're subtracting out this contribution of the number of subarrays you can make that um, is order k, update count x, and then add it back. So it's the same pattern as before. Any questions on this? This is probably the most confusing problem we're going to do today. So our last problem, um, again, you get an array of size n and q queries of the form LR. And you want to print out how many numbers x occur exactly x times in the subarray. So uh, for this subarray, the answer would be 2, because 1 occurs once and 2 occurs twice, right? because x is occurring x number of times, basically. So this one um, should be much easier to think about than the last one. Um, how can we sort of do the subtract out contribution, update value, add back contribution in this case? Yeah, and then how do you maintain the answer? What is the contribution specifically? What specifically is the point of the answer? Right. right. Um, pretty much, but I guess, um, like when are you adding and subtracting by one? Like when does X contribute something to your answer? Exactly. Um, yeah, so the solution for this, we want to maintain the count of every number in the current range. Um, and the contribution is whether count x equals x. So contribution is either 0 or 1. And notice that we don't need to store x's above max n, above basically n, um, because if x is bigger than n, it can never appear x times. So this way, we can store our counts in an array and not in a map, um, because I think your x's can get big here. Yeah, they can go up to 1e9. Um, 
So basically our implementation would look like this. So we store the count of every value and uh, total is our answer. Um, so if X is bigger than N, we just return because that's never gonna have any contribution. Otherwise, we subtract out count X equals X. And because of the way Booleans work in C++, it will cast this to either zero or one based on if it's true or false. So this is subtracting out either zero or one. Um, count X plus equals D. Once again, we're doing the plus one minus one, and then we add the contribution back. So this is the same pattern as the other problems. Um, we're doing the add and subtract contribution trick again. All right, any questions on this? Okay. Yeah, so thank you guys for coming. Uh, we have a bunch of links to the problems and other resources on the next few slides. Um, as always, you can find these slides in the info channel on Discord. So uh, next week, we're gonna be talking about segment trees, uh, which are kind of solving a similar problem. Um, the implementation is a little bit more in depth, um, but basically it lets you also modify the array um, and you can process queries in order, which is important for a lot of these problems. Um, so like one example problem would be if you have an array of size n and q queries of the form, um, basically either set a given value to k or print range sums. Uh, this will allow you to do those queries in log n time. So yeah, I hope to see you guys here next week.